What did you see the Jets doing? I know a lot of people came out and thought that the Jets were going after a wide receiver or a tight end. I, I think they surprised a lot of people. I wasn't surprised, but they surprised a lot of people going after uh, Olu, uh, Olu, who is a fantastic uh uh, offensive lineman, I think might be the best offensive lineman in his class, which has been a very deep offensive line class. What were your thoughts to the Jets? Did you think the Jets were going after a wide receiver or a tight end? I thought it was going to be either an offensive lineman or tight end. Apparently, we found out afterwards, at least they said, every team says odd things after the draft. But Joe Douglas said that the Brock Bowers thing was nearly a smokescreen. They were just going to go offensive line the entire time. And honestly, it's what I thought they needed to do because we're looking at a one, two-year window for Aaron Rodgers. We all know the offensive line, you know, even after Aaron Rodgers, since he only played one snap, got injured. We all know they were a major issue last year. And although they did do a lot of moves in free agency to improve that unit, we've seen the Bengals and Bills most recently in the last two to three years prove that just slapping things together on paper and free agency doesn't necessarily improve the product whenever they come to the field. Even a veteran like Tyron Smith, um, that was his most games played last season in the last five years. It's only a one-year, $4 million contract. So I actually thought they did need an offensive line just to make sure that this one- to two-year window with Rodgers can actually be played out, can actually keep him protected. So I believe they, they made the correct move there. And then we'll see. It's so volatile with all these, not just the offensive line deals, but with Mike Williams, who's historically been injured on a one-year deal as well. But if he's at full strength, we know how explosive he is when he's fully healthy. Uh, they're a fascinating team, honestly, because they range from the typical four to six win Jets to a 13 win perennial like division contestant. So I'm excited to see if it all comes together, at least beginning in training camp. So the Giants, they were. everyone was wondering if they were going to trade back, trade up for Drake May, possibly draft a quarterback at six. They were interested in J.J. McCarthy. They end up going Malik May versus keeping Daniel Jones. What are your thoughts to that? Do you think they made the right decision? I do, yes. And everyone really, I know the quarterback rumors started swirling in the twilight hours, and I didn't even have a good draft betting weekend. Uh, it, it's gotten a lot harder the last two years, but I did have JJ McCarthy over five and a half. That's one bet that really saved my ass at plus money in the last 48 hours, just because it seemed like we could whittle out McCarthy from the Giants process. And if that was the case, then we knew the Cardinals weren't trading with the Vikings because the Cardinals, if they didn't get either Marvin Harrison Jr. or Malik Neighbors, someone was getting fired there. They literally couldn't afford to trade down to 11. It made no sense. And from there, we also knew Harbaugh was going to take whichever offensive lineman he liked the most. Joe Alt was a chalk. Alt got there. But they were just going to take whatever lineman they needed the most, they liked the most, at number five overall. So I luckily backdoored J.J. McCarthy over in the last 48 hours, and I was very happy with that. But the Giants, I also think it's very clear, one, that they took on Daniel Jones last year. We were all questioning why at the time. Uh, they had, I, I understood they were in purgatory. They, they really had a choice of having no quarterback or at least a league average at best is what we think Daniel Jones is, um, for a few years. And they kind of had no choice then, but to give him a little bit of extra money and be strapped down for two years with him. But very clearly it's all gone wrong. Uh, I don't think they're interested in anymore. I think they're looking for that long-term answer. And honestly, from what I've heard behind the scenes, like it seems like if Drew Locke's going to play well the first month, as Daniel Jones continues to rehab from last year's injury, it may be Drew Locke's job this year, quite honestly. So I think we're still looking at a rebuilding team. And so Malik Neighbors' choice didn't really surprise me since – He's much better than the I shouldn't just say slot receivers. He's much better than the guys they typically target, but that is the kind of guy they target. Someone who can get open over the middle of the field and then turn up field to create yards after the catch. That's what Malik Neighbors is. There was a surprise in the first 10 picks, and 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 everything kind of fell exactly the way everybody thought mm -hmm. everything was going to fall until the eighth pick. And Michael Penix fell to Atlanta. And even Kirk Cousins, all over social media, was like shocked. Everybody was shocked that Michael Penix was going in the top 10. I, you know, on my draft board, he was probably in the second round, early second round. I didn't even think he was getting drafted in the first round. I didn't think there was there's a lot of questions to Michael Penix and 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 in his game. 
What were your thoughts? Did you think that Atlanta was going to sneak in there and, and draft a quarterback when everybody was saying it was going to be a defensive lineman? Absolutely not. Uh, the only wild card I had them doing was drafting Romo Dunze if they wanted to add to their three ride sets, which we know Zach Robinson, new offensive coordinator, is going to run heavily there since that's just the Sean McVay tree since he comes from Los Angeles. That's exactly what Kevin O'Connell did when he went from Minnesota. That's exactly what we believe Zach Robinson will do with Atlanta. So to swoop in and then grab a 24-year-old quarterback with multiple knee injuries in his past was very odd. I I wouldn't even say I, I hate the pick um, from a pro. No, I hate the pick from a process standpoint. I don't necessarily hate the player if they were to do that. My issue is they should have chose one or the other. Like right now, best ball, for example, on whatever platform everyone plays on, underdog, FFPC, the list goes on. We we draft as if we're right because we're playing for millions of dollars. Um, And so like if I draft a quarterback in the first five rounds, whether I think that quarterback is actually going to be a top five option. Like I have to treat them like that. And I can only draft two of them because I used high fantasy football draft capital on them. The Falcons, but gave Kirk cousins, a hundred million guaranteed. It's basically a two year contract. And we've seen all kinds of deals now escaped out of whether it's Matthew Stafford's Jared Goff's Matt Ryan, Carson Wentz, Todd Gurley. We've seen that the NFL. Now you can separate with literally any contract you'd like to Russell Wilson, but this past year, I'm not so much worried about that, but it does make it complicated since we're looking at 30 plus million next year, not this year, next year, they'd have to take on a dead cat money if they were to release or trade them overall. And so to give Kirk Cousins a hundred million dollars guaranteed and a two year deal essentially, and then also to draft a 24 year old quarterback who we then think he may not start till he's 26, 27, again, multiple injuries. The process just wasn't right at all. They it's, it's like they, made the Kirk Cousins deal, but didn't bet on Kirk Cousins. It's so odd. And so that's where I think they did wrong, not in just drafting Michael Penix, then letting everyone throw their player take out there. So Marvin Harrison getting drafted by the Cardinals. We've seen yeah. this a lot in fantasy football, these super athletic wide receivers getting drafted as early as the third round. We saw that with Julio Jones. We saw that with Jamar Chase in uh, his rookie year. Like where are you seeing fantasy projection wise for somebody like Marvin Harrison Jr. Who's with a good quarterback in Kyler Murray, but on a really bad team. And I was just adjusting some tiers behind the scenes before I came on. So uh, <laughs> li like y'all, I'm trying to get off work and watch the next game, but I'm failing at that. So I will say right now, Marvin Harris Jr. falls around the wide receiver 15-16 range uh, in tier three, basically, behind Debo Samuel, uh, uh, Jalen Waddle, a couple of other, those guys. Devonta Smith, a couple of those other guys that are jammed in around there. And I think the offense is going to have a lot of success. Not only does Kyler Murray stand alone as a sexy option because he adds a rushing floor with his legs, but unlike Bobby Slowick, a lot of people gave Bobby Slowick, the Texans offensive coordinator, for anyone listening, a lot of praise. But I, I thought he underwhelmed. And really the only game he played to win in without – running on early downs, forcing C.J. Stroud into long third downs that Stroud overcame just because Stroud is like the, the GOAT. That's the only reason the Texans offense looks so great because Stroud like was that great. Um, the issue is that the only game the Texans really played to win was that Colts primetime, essentially week 18 playoff game on Saturday night when they were just letting it fly. But then you fast forward to the wild card round and even before the Browns just took over on defense – it wasn't, or I'm sorry, even before, yeah, they took over on defense. It wasn't that at all. Like they were just still running on early downs and taking Stroud out of the game and asking him to do far too much in his first playoff game. Um, it was very odd. And so uh, while I was underwhelmed by Bobby Slowick, I do think Drew Petzing, the offensive coordinator for the Cardinals, showed a lot of promise, specifically in the Cardinals' run game last year. Whether it be a good stack boxes or tougher defenses, he knew how to creatively call plays and scheme the offense to let James Conner, uh, an aging veteran, run wild. And even James Conner had our five consecutive games of top 12 finishes in his last five starts for injury. So I have a lot of faith in Petsing and what he can do to free up Marvin Harrison Jr. in his rookie year, plus with Kyler and a couple of other options there and improved offensive line as well. I'm excited for the Cardinals this year and Marvin Harrison Jr. too.